So today, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, called The Charge to Titus. So really excited today to get into this uh, new book here. This is the third of what are called the pastoral epistles. Now show of hands, who knows why, uh, what the other two are? Cool. What are they, Mike? Timothy. Yeah, one and two, Timothy. Yeah. Okay. Who knows why they're called the pastoral epistles? Anybody? Jeff. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay, excellent. So Titus is a letter written to a young pastor. Now it's very similar to 1 Timothy and it was written about the same time. So it contains instructions for church organization and for Christian conduct. Now you can see on the book outline here, it's also on the screen, I've handed it to you. This is kind of how the book lays out. First of all, today our message, the charge to Titus, verses uh, 1 through 5, chapter 1. Then number two, the qualifications for elders. You see that there? And the task of the elders. Then you see a section on Christian conduct. First of all, Christian conduct geared at specific groups of people. Then Christian conduct in general. And then there's a conclusion. So it's a short book, three chapters, but there are so many useful truths, practical truths in this book that I'm just really excited to look at it. Turn to Titus chapter 2 and verse 10. I want to show you a couple of the key verses of the book here. Titus chapter 2 verse 10, the end of the verse uh, 10 is one of the themes of the whole book. It says, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity in this part that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, what it means to adorn is to simply make something attractive. And so the author is writing to this Titus guy, and he's saying, I want these churches that you're overseeing to adorn the doctrine of God. I want them to make the doctrine of God attractive. Now, how would somebody make the doctrine of God attractive? Anybody? Aaron? Smiling, that probably. Living it. Living it, right? That's one of the main themes of this book is not only do you know the truth, but you really live the truth so that you would adorn the doctrine. So people would look at you and say, you know, I can tell by the way you live that you're a Christian and it's attractive. I want to be a Christian too. Turn to Titus chapter 3 verse 14. Here's another one of the key verses so that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And then chapter 3, verse 14 says this, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Now that was a problem in the churches that Titus was overseeing. You see, they had the doctrine. They knew the things that they needed to do to pass Sunday school, right? But they didn't necessarily do the works that lined up with the doctrine. Now, Christianity is not just believing some stuff. It's also living the stuff that we believe. And so that's kind of the theme of Titus. You can notice this as you go through the Bible. And if you like to highlight your Bible, why don't you highlight every time you see the term sound doctrine and also good deeds, sound doctrine and good deeds. That's kind of the theme of the book of Titus. So you'll notice those words, and uh, if you want to highlight them, you'll see how many times they show up. So Paul writes this letter to Titus, instructing him to get these churches that he oversees in order, to appoint leadership over them, and to teach these people how to live as Christians in the light of the gospel of grace. This short letter is chocked full of great principles. Now, if you're interested in serving the Lord, we've had Uh, a lot of interest in people wanting to serve lately. And so this book is going to be very helpful to you um, as we go through this. And I'm going to come at it sort of from that perspective. I'm going to pull out servant principles. You want to serve God? Here is like some training uh, in this book. And I'll pull these things out and we'll draw our attention to them as we go through. So in today's message, we're going to look at the introduction of the book where Paul, the author, gives the charge to Titus. We're going to discover some uh, very important principles related to serving God. Now, we're going to kind of do a thing where we're going to go through the text and explain it. And then at the end, I'm going to focus on one thing that has to do with like application. Okay. And we're going to spend some time there. So that's kind of where we're headed today. Titus beginning at verse one. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness 
in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace Mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Father, we do thank you as we turn to your word here today and we approach it as what it is, the very word of God. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us beyond the word of a man that your spirit would speak directly to us, Lord. It's our will to open our hearts to you to receive. And we ask that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. The outline for this message is very simple. Three parts today. Paul's position and purpose, number one, the salutation to Titus, verse four, number two, and number three, verse five, the charge to Titus. So let's look at Paul's position and purpose to start with. He says, Paul, a bondservant of God. Now, right away, we see the author, he identifies himself right in the first verse, right in the first word. Now, they used to write letters like this in Paul's day and age. They didn't write a whole letter and at the end put sincerely Paul, right? They did it right at the beginning. And so Paul, in typical writing style of that day and age, identifies himself as the author right away. Now, if you don't know a lot about Paul, Paul used to be a persecutor of the Christian church. In fact, he was responsible for the murder of probably many Christians. Um, He was on a mission to go into towns, find Christians, drag them out of their homes, and then bring them to be charged for blasphemy. So he was out to destroy the church. And it's pretty interesting that this apostle uh, Paul here, he ends up writing like most of the New Testament. He plants more churches than anybody else. And you say, well, that's fascinating that you can go from a murderer to a missionary, right? And that's very encouraging to anybody that wants to serve the Lord today because guaranteed as you step up to serve the Lord and you fulfill your place in the body of Christ, I guarantee that the enemy will come to you and say, you are not worthy to do this. And then what I always like to do when the enemy says, Adam, you're not worthy to do this, I say, well, you know what? Paul was a murderer and he became a missionary, a persecutor that became a pastor. And so I just throw that back and I say, you know what? It's not about being worthy. It's about the one who is worthy, right? And so that's very helpful for you today if you want to serve the Lord as well. Now, look at his title of bondservant. Verse one there, he says he's a bondservant of God. Now, that word bondservant is the Greek word, doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, doulos. Now, you can see it in your Bible there. That's a very important word. What it means is one who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his master. One who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his master. Do you see yourself as one who is completely at the disposal of Jesus Christ? Because that's what Paul is saying as a Christian here. He's saying, I am completely at the disposal of Jesus Christ. My life belongs to him, right? Now, that's not very common today in some Christian circles where it's like, I'm kind of the boss of my life, maybe except on Sunday, or maybe except when I need something, or maybe except when I biffed it. But the other time, I'm just kind of living as like I'm my own boss, But what Paul says is, he says, I have no rights to my life whatsoever. Jesus Christ is my master. I'm a bondservant of God. Now, that's a title of humble obedience. There's another servant principle. Serving the kingdom of God requires humble obedience, submitting to Christ and giving your life to him fully, being at his disposal. Now, the next title that Paul gives of himself, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle in the Greek is the word apostolos or apostolos. It's just the English word is just a transliteration of the Greek word. Now, all it means is one who is sent. This is a title of great authority, right? He's sent with the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, this proper title of apostle was given to 12 men in the Bible and Paul. Who knows the 12 men? I'm just kidding. All of them? All of them? (laughs) 
Pretty close, yeah. It's probably a song about it. John Jacob Jingleheimer. Well, no, that's not the song. <laughs> so that's the title of great authority. Now, if bond servant is the title of great humility, apostle is the title of great authority. Paul was speaking and ministering in the authority of Jesus Christ. This title with a capital A in this position has only been given to 12 men plus Paul. Now, there are people today, and I just want to make this as an aside, that claim to be apostles. Now, there are people today that have a similar ministry. They're church planters and, and so on and so forth. But I would encourage you, uh, as the flock here, to be a little, you know, there should be a check in your spirit if you come across a teacher that calls themselves an apostle. Because they could be assuming that they have some sort of authority that they don't really have. Right? And that's actually pretty common in the body of Christ. There's actually something going around now called the New Apostolic Reformation or the NAR. Now, if you'd like to Google that, if you're a good Berean, if you're a person that likes to just, you know, be sure that you don't get you know, swept up with fads and trends and winds of doctrine, why don't you Google the New Apostolic Reformation or the NAR? And, and I'm not saying uh, to, you know, to be a heresy hunter or anything, but just have a check in your spirit. If somebody says, hey, you know, I'm an apostle, you buy their book and at the bottom the author says, apostle you know, John, somebody or other, that should put a check in your spirit because it doesn't sound very humble to me personally to call myself by any title. You know, if you think about it, you know, Jesus is the one that deserves the titles, right? Now, Paul's purpose, look in verse one there. He says um, his purpose is to nurture the faith and knowledge of believers to bring about godliness in their lives. That's what he means when he says, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. Paul is an apostle sent to those who are God's elect, that's just another word for Christians, to bring them into a life of godliness through truth. He's going, Paul says, it's my job to minister to your faith, to preach the gospel to you, and to teach the truth to you, which is to bring about godliness in your life. Now, <clears throat> there you know he's touching on the main theme of the book, isn't he? That's what we just talked about. The truth, you have the truth, but is it leading to godliness in your life? Now, that's a very good question for us to ask ourselves today. Are our lives growing in godliness, right? Now, what is godliness? Well, here's a simple way to think of it. It's just God-likeness, right? Paul says that I'm sent to minister the truth to people so it might bring about God-likeness in their life. Now, today, if you are growing in the faith and growing in knowledge it is resulting in increasing godliness in your life. Godliness, though, is not merely, and this is a really important point, godliness is not merely abstaining from certain behaviors. Do you know what I mean? Some people will say, I'm godly. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't abuse my wife. I don't kick my dog. I, you know, I don't yell at people at the grocery store and stuff like that. I'm godly. Well, Godliness is not merely abstaining from sinful, evil behaviors. That's not the extent of godliness. Godliness is a positive thing. Let me, let me give you some examples. If you're growing in godliness, right, you're increasingly compassionate. You're less critical of people. You're more self-sacrificing. You're kinder, gentler. You're a better listener. You're more willing to bear the burdens of others. You're more open and willing to let people bear your burdens, your speech is sweeter. You're more transparent. You're quicker to ask for forgiveness and, and confess your sins. You're less self-reliant and more dependent upon God in prayer and through His Word. Um, your sense of humor is cleaner. You're not as sarcastic and innuendos and perverted and all these different things. You're um, growing in simplicity. Your life isn't marked by, you know, excessive materialism and worldliness. You're joyful. You see the best in others. You treat others how you want to be treated. You are loving. That's what it means to be growing in godliness is where I can look at myself and I can say, I am growing in these things. I'm a heck of a long way off in some of these things. I'll tell you that. But I'm growing in these things. And I'm certainly not even the same person as I was last month right? And I can say that with confidence because I know always what God is working on in my life. I'm in the word. I'm in prayer. I know what he's doing in my life. I have friends that are speaking into my life, correcting me. I have a pastor that's speaking into my life, correcting me. And so that's what it means to be growing in godliness, right? 
It's not just to abstain from some certain behaviors. And that's a, that's a big problem with some of us that came from the dark side. We think because we've stopped doing the things that we used to do that now we're godly. Well, that's great that you've stopped doing those things that you used to do. But how about putting on godliness now? How about growing into being godlike, Christ-like? And that's what Paul says his mission is, is to bring the teaching from the word to people to bring about godliness in their life. Now, servant principle, you must be rooted in the knowledge of God and that knowledge must be producing godly living in your life. Now, Paul's hope, verse 2, the promise of eternal life. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. Now, Paul was an apostle in the hope of eternal life. Now, hope for the Christian, it's not wishful thinking. It's confident assurance and expectation that God will fulfill that which he has promised. That's what Christian hope is. Do you have that hope today? You know, Paul had that hope. And he was ministering on the basis of that hope to people. This is the sort of uh, term, this this eternal life. um, Eternal life isn't just duration. It just doesn't mean that I'm going to live forever. That's not the full extent of eternal life. Eternal life is a quality of life that will continue forever. It's the very life of God coming inside of you as a Christian. That is eternal life. The the second that you said yes to Jesus Christ, you inherited eternal life. You inherited a new quality of life, new desires, new ambitions in life, new preferences, a new heart. And that will continue on forever. And Paul lives in that hope. That's what we talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. We talked about uh, the hope that Christians live in. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others do that have no hope, right? He says, we believe Jesus and died, that he rose again, and that even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You guys remember that from 1 Thessalonians, looking forward in hope to the rapture of the church. John 14, verses 1 through 3 says, don't let your heart be troubled, Jesus says. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that, you, uh, that where I am, that you may be also. That's the hope that Christians live in today. And Paul was an apostle that was sent to minister to people's faith, to bring about godliness in their life through the truth. And it was all on the basis of Christian hope. He said that God promised this before time began. That's an interesting statement. Do you see that there? The plan for salvation, the redemption of man, God already had that in his mind um, before time even began. You know, time's a created thing. God created time. Before time even began, he had the plan for redemption already in his mind. And he says that God who had this plan for redemption in his mind cannot lie. That is a really important statement also because it's talking about the nature of God himself. When we study doctrine, we study who God is. If you have any basic theology book or a systematic theology book, there'll be a section on who God is, right? Kind of like we're studying on Sunday evenings. And what it says here is God cannot lie. That's a good, that's a good um, quality about God, isn't it? Can you imagine if God could lie? Can you imagine that? That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Man, God, you told me to do this, and I did it. God, well, you know what? I don't like you anymore. I'll, I changed my mind. I lied. <laughs> what? Isn't that interesting how innately all of us trust that God does not lie, right? That's, what it, that's godliness. God does not lie. Now, it's a comforting thought to know that he won't, he won't lie to us. His word doesn't change, you know? You don't get the revised edition of the Bible. By the way, if you ever see the Bible revised edition, don't, don't get that book, you know, don't, don't buy that one, you know, even if it's on Kindle, you know, for like 99 cents, don't buy it. Now, Paul's commission, verse three. So he just gets done talking about how the plan for redemption, the gospel of Jesus Christ existed before all time. And then look right there in verse three. He says, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So this plan for redemption that God had in due time, at the right time, in other words, he manifested this plan. He made it visible through preaching. Do you know what it means to manifest something? Here, I'll manifest the iPad to you. See, I I manifested it and I unmanifested it right there. That's all it means to manifest. So God took his plan of salvation 
and he manifested it to people through preaching, through the teaching of the word, right? Very important stuff to realize here um, that this is a servant principle. If you're serving Jesus Christ, you have to realize that man's salvation comes through the proclamation of the gospel. That's how people get saved. Some people say, well, um, you know, I just have a relationship with God. I go out to nature and I hang out and um, I know that God loves me and stuff. Well, if you don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ, that isn't enough to save you. You've got to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that is manifested through the preaching. And that's what Paul's saying there. If you want to serve the Lord, something to aspire to do is to be able to share the gospel with people in a way that can bring them to salvation. There was a study done by Barna that showed a remarkably low percentage of Christians will ever lead anybody to salvation. They kind of just think that, you know, oh, we'll bring him to church and the pastor, he'll share the gospel. But there's a percentage of Christians that may have even been walking with the Lord for like 200 years that will never share the gospel with anybody and will never lead anybody to salvation. Now, that's sad because the one commission that Jesus has given us is to lead people to salvation, you know? The one thing that he said was, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures, right? I mean, he told us to do that. So one thing you want to do as a servant is you want to learn how to share the gospel, right? Aaron actually has a book that has, what, 52 ways, something, 30-something ways to share the gospel, 42 ways in a book. Did you know there were 42 ways to share the gospel? I mean, she has a book that explains it. All you'd have to do is just memorize those things, right? And then you could go figure out and and go start telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's the good news. If you believe that you're saved here today, you already know how to have somebody else get saved then. Because you can't be saved if you don't know what it takes to be saved. And if you know what it takes to be saved, you can tell somebody else how to be saved, right? So that's, that's the a servant principle out of right there, is you can manifest the Word of God. There's so many ways to manifest the Word of God today, by the way. Um, you know, where it says in due time, do you guys know too much about the world? I don't know too much about the world when Jesus Christ came into the world, but there were all kinds of ideal situations that meant that the gospel could spread easily. Uh, in the Roman Empire, the trade routes were just bustling. There were, you know, good established roads. Um, there was the common language that everybody spoke, Koine Greek. Um, there was a general peace that was going on called the Pax Romana. Now it was a forced peace. They would violently enforce peace. (laughs) But there was generally a peace. And there was an overall expectation of Messiah at this time. There were Jews that had, you know, looked at the book of Daniel, understood the prophetic things, and they were waiting for the Messiah. So all of those conditions were just right for when Christ came and for the gospel came to spread. Something very similar happened um, later on when, with the invention of the Gutenberg press, right? What happened after the printing press came into existence, right? The Bible got into all kinds of people's hands that it wasn't before. In fact, you know, it was like right at the time when, you know, because Rome, the Roman Catholic Church at that time, you know, didn't let people have the Bible. And, but then, you know, there were people working against that, the Protestants, right? And, and they, eventually, the, here comes the printing press, and then all of a sudden, here comes the Bible to get into the hands of people like you and me, when really uh, the Roman church had it locked up because they told us that we weren't able to understand it and stuff like that. So the printing press at the time was right then. Think about this now with the internet, right? Oh my goodness, there's so many ways to manifest the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God. You could do it with Facebook. You could do it with a Twitter. You could do it with the TikTok. You could do it with the Snapchat. You could do it any different way that you wanted to, you know? You could use your Facebook. You could use your tools for godliness, right? You could manifest. I was talking with Ethan one day here, talking about gaming. And he says, I play games with all these people online and we build stuff in Minecraft. I was like, dude, you should build a church, man. And then you could share the gospel with people. And he, he, you know, and then we kept talking about stuff. But man, there's so many ways you can manifest the gospel. There's so many things that you could do as a servant of Christ. A lot of people play like, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're on your phone anyway, right? You know what I mean? It's like surgically grafted to your finger, you know what I mean? And you're, you're, you know, you're addicted to it. You might as well turn it into something good for the kingdom, right? No. He says, this was, a, this was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Paul knew the work of preaching was entrusted to him, but it's not to him only. This work is committed to all believers. Now, as I say that to you here today, um, you guys know me. I'm kind of hardcore and everything else, but I want to say this gently that the preaching of the gospel has been assigned to you, you know, to you. And if you're, if you're sitting here and you're not involved with that today, um, 
you know, you got to really, you got to really check yourself because God has called you to share Jesus with other people. And I'm not trying to say you have to do it to be saved. You should do it because you are saved. You should want to, you know, I mean, God dug me out of a gutter, right? Why wouldn't I want to tell other people about that? You know, so just something to think about. So manifest the gospel, make it plain. That's another uh, servant principle. So the position and purpose of Paul there, number one, a servant of God, apostle Jesus Christ, sent to nurture the faith and the knowledge of believers, making manifest the word of God. The salutation to Titus, verse four. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. I just want to point something out as an aside. Look at back to verse three where he says that the charge of preaching was committed to him. Look at what it says there. He says, to the, uh, which was committed to me, see where I'm at, to the commandment of God our Savior. Now read verse 4. It says, to Titus, true son in the faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. In verse 3, he says, God our Savior. In verse 4, he says, Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, I point that out because there are people today that say the Bible doesn't call Jesus God. It's all over through the Bible in ways like this, right? Paul is using the terms interchangeably. He's saying, I have a Savior. It's God. It's Jesus. It's God. It's Jesus. He uses it interchangeably. And anybody that pays attention to the Bible carefully sees those things, right? Now, to Titus. Now, this um, is the letter's recipient. When studying the word, um, we always want to find out who wrote it, who was it written to, when was it written? What were things like when it was written? Why was it written? All these things are important to understand before you start asking what it means to you. And so here we see it's written by Paul to Titus, right? And he says, Titus is a true son in our common faith. Now, he also calls Timothy a true son in the faith. He also calls Onesimus from the book of Philemon a true son in the faith. We don't know too much about Titus, though, but let's talk about him for a second, at least. Um, he's a little baby that goes to the Calvary Chapel with cute cheeks. No, that is Titus, but this is a different Titus, different Titus here. He's not mentioned by name in the book of Acts, so we don't know too much about him. The, you know, the Acts is the book of the early church, how the missionaries um, went out and spread the church in a bunch of different places. By the way, it doesn't include everything that was going on in the Christian church, just what the Holy Spirit wanted us to have. No, we know that Titus was a Gentile, we know that he was likely converted under Paul's ministry, the term true son in the faith. Um, he's probably converted under Paul's ministry. He was a beloved friend and helper of Paul. And we know that from 2 Corinthians. He was a minister to the church in Corinth. He was thoroughly trustworthy and not self-centered, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. He went with Paul to the Jerusalem council which you can read about in Acts chapter 15. Now, that's significant because the Jerusalem council was the first church council. And they got together, like church councils do, to argue about, um, you know, to, to, not to argue as much as to work out problems of doctrine. Now, the thing that they were discussing at the Jerusalem council in the early church was, do Christians need to become Jews to be Christians? Do Christians need to be circumcised? Do they need to observe the Sabbath? Do they need to keep the laws of Moses that were given to the Jews? And so there was a problem with that in the early church. Paul would minister and say, no, you're saved by grace through faith, not as a result of your works. Nothing to do with that. And then people would come behind Paul and say, Paul's wrong. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to eat the kosher laws. You've got to be a Jew to become a Christian. So they got together in Acts chapter 15 to determine that salvation was by grace through faith, not a result of works, right? Hallelujah, right? Because can you imagine if people came here to get saved and we're like, oh, cool, you got saved. You, you know, you're 30 years old. Uh, you got to get circumcised. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it proves that just salvation is not about your works. It is a gift of grace. Now, Titus... Being at that Jerusalem council would have been great ministerial experience for him, right? Watching James and John and Peter and all these guys, you know, argue it out, the, you know, the original, uh, you know, disciples and arguing about these matters of legalism and Titus would be observing and he would come away from there going, you know what, the gospel, you know, he'd know the gospel, you know, this is by grace through faith. And so great experience for Titus uh, to be at such a thing. So he was familiar with the Judaizers, right? He's going to know how to deal with false teachers, and that's something, by the way, that a minister needs to know how to deal with. 
is with false teaching. He was left in Crete to oversee the churches. That's what we learned from uh, verse 5 of our text today. He was also in uh, Rome with Paul in Paul's last imprisonment. Now, Titus, apparently what we gather from reading in 2 Corinthians and everything, he was apparently a man of great character, right? The kind of guy that could be trusted with ministry. Now, that's a very important trait to have in a person. Somebody, a person of character and a person that can be trusted with ministry. And then Paul says to him, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Do you notice something different about Paul's greeting right here? Who knows this is a little different? What's different about it? Mercy, right? He adds mercy. Now he does, because typically Paul says grace and peace from God, you know, peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? But here he says grace, mercy, and peace. And, you know, people speculate why, but he also says it to Timothy also, which was also a young pastor. And so I think what he's doing is he's including mercy, you know, because there's another thing too. Servants of the Lord need to remember the Lord's mercy, not only to yourself when you don't live up to the standard that you can't ever live up to, right? But you also need to be sure to give mercy to others, which is something that comes through age, I'm learning, and um, mercy. So he adds mercy here, probably because ministers need mercy. Now, so Paul's writing to Titus, the young minister, a pastor, to give him instructions. Here we'll find out why in the next verse, the charge of Titus, or the charge to Titus, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should... Set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So he's left on the island of Crete to set in order the things that are lacking. Interestingly enough, in Warren Wearsby's commentary, he says that this Greek word translated set in order is like a medical term, and it has to do with setting a bone back in place that's out of joint. Has anybody ever done that? I remember when I was young and I caught a football and the things went <laughs> like that and I did uh, set them back, you know, enjoy. You ever had to do that with your nose, like your nose is broken? And then so you got to take the, um, the popsicle stick and put up it and <laughs> like that. And they're like, oh, and then it pops and then you're bleeding everywhere. That's the term there. Um, to set things back in order that are out of order, right? It's a bad thing when the church is out of order, isn't it? And that's what Titus' mission is on the island of Crete is to set the bone back in place. Now, Crete is an island 170 miles south of the Greek mainland. It's the largest of the Greek islands. It's 156 miles long from east to west and at most 35 miles wide north to south. Um, can you imagine? I mean, we're talking, you know, off the coast of Greece. This place is gorgeous, man. Can you smell the air? These palm trees kind of remind you of it a little bit. You know, if we had a little, uh, maybe we should get a, a essential oil with the Mediterranean, you know, or it's, well, it's the Aegean, isn't it? But Anyhow, Crete was known for um, being like a pirate base, actually, before it came under Roman control in 67 BC. The island had a substantial Jewish population during the New Testament period. And so that's, you'll see in this letter, Paul was worried about the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians, you know, and the Jews there too, that were trying to tell the Christians they needed to be circumcised and keep the law and all that other stuff. There were false teachers there but it had a pretty good-sized Jewish population. And um, it's actually known for quite a few other negative things. There is a poet um, named Epimenides, a Greek poet from this time, and he says this, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Now, it actually says that in chapter 2 of Titus here. Paul actually quotes that poem, right? There was also a Roman poet named Ovid, and he referred to Crete as Mendex Creta, or Lying Crete. Now, the Greeks actually had a term called to cretize. Now, what it meant to be to cretize, it meant to lie. It was a synonym for lying. It's kind of like, you know, to be a Corinthian, right? If you were a Corinthian, if you were known as a Corinthian, he lives like a Corinthian, you were like drunk and, you know, abusing sex and everything else and money and everything. The Cretans were known it was like their vice of choice was lying. And that's why Paul, you know, quotes this poem there. Here's another uh, <clears throat> commentator says, Cretan lifestyle was known for its excesses. These terms paint with sharp accuracy another of the evil characteristics of the Cretan people, 
their dull gluttony, and their slothful sensuality. So there is no evangelistic campaign recorded in the book of Acts there. In other words, we don't know how the churches got planted there. There is a mention of it in Acts when he's on his way to Rome when Paul is and he's on the ship. And you remember the shipwreck happens on that you know, journey that time. They touched in the island of Crete. They're just there just momentarily though. So unlikely that they planted any churches at that time. What we believe is probably their churches came after Acts 2 because it says in Acts 2, chapter 11, you remember where the new church is the, um, baptizing the Holy Spirit, they're speaking in tongues. And remember it says all the people heard in their native language and there were Cretans among them. So we believe that those Jews that were there at Pentecost got converted, went back to the island of Crete, planted churches. Paul touched down there. And then Paul came there again later and there were a bunch of new churches there that needed leadership and care. Now, this was not an easy task because of the things that I mentioned about Crete, right? Can you imagine? You know, you're, um, it reminds me of the story of Alistair Begg, you know, like his, his story, like, uh, you know, he was in Scotland and everything, and, and, you know, the Lord put a call on him to go to Cleveland, <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, I don't know if you've been there, but uh, it's not the nicest place in the world, and um, it's kind of an interesting thing that even in a place that's marked by, you know, gluttony and lying and evil, that God wants to plant a church there, you know, and he wants to bring something good. A spirit-filled, Jesus-centered church can transform any culture, right? Amen, right? Look what he's done with us, right? Look what he's done with my life. I mean, you take, take me from the gutter, from abusing drugs and, and abusing myself and, and things like that, and, and straighten us out, right? And that's a lot of our testimony here. And that's, that's the island of Crete. And um, so there's some churches there, they're out of order, and they need structure. And so he, he, this is really cool about Titus. Do you guys kind of have a picture of Titus in your mind? It speaks a lot of his character that Paul would think, this is a massive task, right? This is a massive task, getting these multiple churches in order. And he thinks, you know, I can just write three chapters. The chapters weren't in the originals. I mean, it was just one letter. And he says, I can write a letter to this guy and I can bank on it that that guy is going to do everything in that letter, Right? Now, that's a servant principle. That's a, that is a, I can't stress that enough of how cool that is about Titus, that he could take this and, he, and Paul knew for certain that he would implement it, right? Now, we always want to be the kind of people that can be trusted to carry out the mission with precision, with little to no supervision, right? Now, he's there to set things in order, verse 5, that you should set things in order that are lacking. Another version has it straightened out, what was left unfinished. Titus' mission was to bring order to the churches on Crete. Now, when you read the book of Timothy, there's qualifications for elders and deacons in there. And Titus, just for elders, right? So it's kind of getting at the church wasn't far along enough to have deacons yet or something. I don't know. That's just a little difference between the two letters. On Crete, we're going to learn this going through the Bible, there was a misappropriation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was legalism, and licentiousness, both happening. Both are misappropriations of the gospel, right? Legalism is saying I need to earn my salvation through my behaviors. And licentiousness is saying because I'm saved by grace through faith, it doesn't matter how I live, right? Both of those things were happening on the island of Crete. And so he's got a mission, but really what he's got to do is just bring a true understanding of the gospel. And we're going to see that in chapter 2 and 3, some of the clearest proclamations of the gospel in the Bible. And he says in verse 5 that he's to appoint leadership to oversee the churches. Now, this is how he is to bring order, by appointing godly men over the churches on the island of Crete. The word elders is the word presbuteros, and that's where it sounds familiar. That's where we get Presbyterian. Originally, it came from a style of church government uh, being elder-led, and that's why it's translated elders here. It's also the same word as bishops in chapter 1, verse 7 of Titus. Elders and bishops... They are pastors over congregations, and Paul says you need to set pastors over these churches in Crete. They're to be men that meet the qualifications that are in verses 6 through 9. We're not going to get there today. Um, so if you're, you, know, you had any desire to be an elder in a church or leading, you're a man, you know, you're a Christian, um, these are some qualifications. Now, I will mention this, that when we have servants come serve at Calvary Chapel, we use the same standards 
um, of character to decide if anybody will serve here and to see where their heart's pointed at. Um, although the office of pastor and overseer is, you know, biblically, I believe the Bible says it's clear it's for men, but we use that standard that's in Titus and in Timothy uh, for character traits for anybody that's going to serve here, you know. So <clears throat> these elders were not to be picked according to worldly standards. Titus was to examine these men's character and qualifications. Leaders are not to be selected randomly simply because they volunteer, because of their age, because of their talents or natural leadership abilities, or because of their business sense, which you'd be surprised. That's a lot of times a guy will get appointed to um, leadership in a church because he's got a business degree. And these are, you know, that can be good, but those are not, you know, or even natural leadership talents. Somebody say, well, you're a natural leader. Yeah, but you might be as unsanctified as the day is long. You know what I mean? You might be a loose cannon. You know, you might not be able to follow directions. You know, if you can't follow, you can't lead. And so he's got to look at these character traits. And uh, we're going to get into those more next week. So Paul writes this letter to a young minister for the purpose of instructing him to bring order to these new churches in this tough area and to set leadership over them. Now, I want to talk about, I told you I was going to come back to a leadership principle at the end here and something, a point of application uh, for us to focus on. We're going to focus on that word bond servant, bond servant. Again, that word is doulos. And again, I'll give you the definition if you missed it last time. It's one who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his master. That's how Paul identified himself. By the way, a lot of other New Testament writers identify themselves that way. And a lot of Old Testament writers, Moses, Jeremiah, they are the servant of the Lord. The psalmist calls himself the servant of the Lord in that psalm we read before service today. Now, under Roman law, a bond servant was personal property of the owner. The slave had no rights of their own. Now, in Roman culture, they say about a third of the population were slaves and about another third were ex-slaves that had either bought their freedom or, you know, had got their freedom somehow or another, right? So the term slave, man, if you were not a slave in Roman culture, you wanted nothing to do with that word, right? It was like a despicable term, right? Now, isn't it kind of interesting that Paul, the apostle, would call himself a bondservant? a menial slave, a humble servant to somebody else? I mean, think about that in our culture even today, right? How many guys do you know, you know, that this like, well, what do you do? Well, I'm actually a slave of Christ. I'm a humble servant. I don't have any rights to my life. I've given them all to Jesus. Man, men aren't like that today. Men are like, let me, let me show you how much status I have by the car that I drive and how tough that I am and the, the stuff that I'm into and stuff like that. And I'm nobody's slave. I will never bow, you know, before anybody. And, you know what I mean? That's, isn't that kind of how it's, men are like macho? You know what I mean? Well, not just men. I know some pretty macho women too, to be honest with you. Uh, I get scared of them. Uh, so, well, yeah, we'll keep going. Now, that's just not really the attitude of 2020, 2021, is it? To be subservient to anybody else, you know? I'm to be my own man, to be my own boss. Well, Paul uses a title that is not the most glamorous title in worldly terms, but it's completely a glamorous term if you want to use that word. It's an honorable term in the kingdom of God. Now, the Old Testament term, ebed, has a similar meaning. But there's an interesting place in which a slave, after serving the six years that the law specified, could become a voluntary servant if the slave chose to. And that's the idea of a bond servant. So I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 21 in your Bible. Turn to Exodus chapter 21. What I'm trying to do is illustrate what a bond servant is for the purpose of you considering that because God has, you know, really called us all to be bond servants of Jesus Christ. And so good to have an understanding of this word. Exodus chapter 21 verses I guess I got to turn there too, don't I? Exodus 21 verses uh, 5 and 6 are really the ones we're going to look at. Okay. And just start at verse 2. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. 
See, God's giving laws about slavery because slavery was like widely abused back then. It was very common. It's not like we think of slavery like when, when we hear the word slavery, we automatically think of down south. We think of the atrocities that went on down south, um, you know, with African-Americans and, and white people and all that business. That's not the full understanding of slavery. Um, it was very common in this day and age that people, you know, would work as slaves. You kind of just think of it as like a, you know, Mr. Belvedere or almost, you know, to some degree, or just a servant um, that's, you know, paid to serve. So, but God comes in and he makes laws about it to make sure that what's going on is humane and so on and so forth. So the Bible doesn't condone slavery, but God does certainly make rules on it so people can't be inhumane about it. Now, that's what he's talking about here. If you buy a Hebrew servant, verse 2, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has bore him some sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, now listen, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost, of it, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Interesting. Jews have some interesting things. I mean, read the book of Ruth about, you know, when taking off your shoe and, you know, there's some weird things that they have going. But do you see what's happening here? This slave that could not go free, he gets to the end of his six years and he has the opportunity now to say, you know what? I love my master. I don't want to go free. And so, okay, we'll take you down to the judge. We'll get the paperwork done and everything like that. But, okay, bring your ear over here. We'll pierce it with an awl. I don't know. It's just part of their culture. And uh, he goes through this thing. And then the slave now will live in the master's house forever and serve him forever. Now, friends, that's the picture of a bond servant. That's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, God, my master, he's so good to me. I don't want to go free. You know what? I made an absolute mess of my life when I went free, if you want to think about it, you know. I mean, my life was empty. It's interesting. Every time I go out free in my own, you know, being my own God, my own boss, my own master, I make a, things get miserable real quick. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go free. That's the picture of a bond servant. If you want to serve the Lord, you know, if you're a Christian here today, this is for you. This is for you to understand this. Have you ever told that to Jesus? Have you ever said, you know, Jesus, you're my master. I love you. I don't want to go free. I don't want to live away from you. I don't want to wander out of the fold, you know, out of the flock to use last week's picture. Paul sees himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Paul pictures himself as the most menial slave in New Testament times, indicating his complete will being given to the Lord. Now, Jesus talked about servanthood many times in the New Testament. Turn to Mark chapter 9. People that want to serve in a church or, or want to, you know, get involved with um, serving Jesus, these are some principles that we have to really get a hold of. Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 36. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. You get the idea? Jesus was walking with his disciples on the road going back to Capernaum, and they were all arguing back and forth with themselves about who was going to be the greatest, and Jesus was probably kind of ahead of them, and they didn't think that he knew. <laughs> Every time you think Jesus doesn't know, he knows, right? He knows what you're thinking right now. So verse 35, Jesus sits down with them. He calls the 12, and he said to them, If any desires to be first, he shall be the last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, uh, he said, well, we'll just stop there at that point. The, the thing I wanted to point out is verse 35. Jesus says to the 12, to his apostles, he says, if anybody desires to be first, 
In other words, if anybody desires to be great, he needs to be the servant of all. He needs to be the last of all, right? That is how it works, serving in the kingdom of God. As I see myself, if I want to be great in the kingdom of God, I need to be the servant of all. I need to be the one that's the quickest to clean up after everybody else and to be last in line, you know, koinonia. It's always interesting. I always like watching the, the uh, koinonias because, you know, and it's not, that, it's not that I expect kids to be all that principled. I mean, somewhat I do. But I always like watching the lines and I, watch, I like watching how people are like, me first, me first, me first, you know. And um, it's really bad when you see adults doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's not as common. Um, you know, or you see somebody just piling up their plate so much that it's like nobody else is going to get anything. And just the, the, the human heart of like me first, right? But that's not, that's not how it is for the servant of God. The servant of the Lord says you first, you know, and I'll be your servant. What can I do to serve you? Now that's the heart of God uh, that he wants for his servants. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. See, Paul had all this in mind when he introduces himself as a bondservant, right? It's a very important lesson for young people to learn um, that life's not all about you, you know? I'm, I had a hard time learning that lesson, you know? It took me until I was about 26 years old before God finally got a hold of me and taught me, Adam, life is not all about you, you know? Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I always get a kick out of that. <laughs> Jesus, I want you to do for me whatever I ask. Really? <laughs> I love how Jesus handles it, you know? I mean, look how Jesus handles it. He said to them, Well, what do you want me to do for you? And I believe he probably said that with his, I bet he's smiling just a little bit. Maybe. I don't know. They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left. I want to be vice president. I want to be CFO of the company here, Jesus. I want to be number one and number two man in charge, you know. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptism, baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He's referring to the cross, right? He's referring to giving his life at the cross, being baptized, being submerged into death, giving his life for other people. That's what he's talking about. And I love it. He, so he says, are you able to do this? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? And look what he says, verse 39. Look what they say. We are able. <laughs> Jesus says, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to go to the cross and give your life and are you able to completely die to self for the good of others? We are able. <laughs> Man, the disciples give me great hope and courage because they were just like us. We're able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And they all did. They were all martyred, you know. Every one of them died for their faith. You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and to sit on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. Now, when the ten heard it, so ten other disciples, not the two that went and asked this question. Look at this, verse 41. When the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Well, you guys, what did you ask Jesus that for? Are you kidding me? You want to be number one and number two? What about the other ten here? Come on, guys. But verse 42 but Jesus called them to himself and he said, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be the first shall be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's a great memory verse if you're looking for one, Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
See, they were arguing on the, on the road about who's going to be the greatest because they were going to exercise authority over the other people. Oh, I can't wait to get this position in the church, you know, because then what I'm going to do as this, you know, position in the church, I'm going to be Apostle Adam Tyler and I'm going to have authority over everybody. I'm going to tell them to do this. They're going to wash my car. They're going to just listen to me and I'm going to have all this power, you know? And Jesus so skillfully, he says, you know what? The people that don't know God, Gentiles, what they do is they exercise, they lord their authority over people. They're like, the, they're like the husband that goes around and says, you need to obey me because I'm your spiritual leader, right? They're lording it over people, threatening people with their leadership, right? Well, I'm the pastor and so you should do this, you know? And where's my parking spot outside with the sign that says pastor's parking spot, you know? And, and how come the organist has their own parking spot? Jesus says, you know what? People that don't know God live like that. He goes, Here, here's what I want you to do. You want to be great? You want to be a leader? Why don't you go around and just see how you can serve everybody and put yourself completely at their disposal? So Paul, a bondservant, all of the rights of his life belong to God. Paul understands the authority that God has over him and is responsible to live as his servant. Now, this attitude is the attitude that God expects from all Christians, right? Every time that we talk about servant principles and we talk about Paul and this, I, I fear that some people may check out and think this doesn't apply to them, but this does apply to all of us as Christians. If you want to, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll just read it though. Um, anyway, verse 18 says this. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He uses the word redeemed there to say, you were literally in slavery to the devil, to the sin and to the flesh of yourself and to sin. And Jesus Christ's blood redeemed you out of that. Get the picture in your mind of you're on the slave block and there's no way for you to get out of there because you've ransomed your life in there through sin, you know, through every lie, everything, all the cheating, every, whatever, all the sin that we've committed. We've ransomed ourselves. We sold ourselves, right, into, into this um, slavery to the enemy. And the picture in 1 Peter 1.18 there is that Jesus came and redeemed you out of the slave block with his blood, like he gave his blood for you. And so we should have that sort of attitude that like, okay, if, if I was a slave to this master, this evil master, and now it was purchased by a new master, I belong to him. Right? I couldn't, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's such a weird thing that the attitude today of so many that you meet that proclaim the name of Christ have no sense of belonging to Jesus. I don't know what they're doing, but they have no sense of actually belonging to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20 says this You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. There are people that are far too complacent with their Christianity today that don't realize that they belong to God and they are called to glorify God in their body. And the last time that they actually checked themselves to see if they do glorify God, they don't even remember when that was. That's the attitude should be of every Christian, right? And Paul says, I'm a bondservant. I belong to God. My life is all about him uh, because he bought me. He redeemed me. He bought me out from the hand of the enemy. He delivered me from sin and death. He's given me eternal life. He's healed me of depression. He's healed me of anxiety. He's healed me of addiction. He's healed me of all these different things. He's given me hope and purpose and life and meaning. Oh, my goodness. And he says we belong to him. Now, that's the principle for us to think about uh, this week. Just think about the principle of bond servant um, this week and, you know, kind of reflect on what we have here. We want, you know, there's, there's opportunities to serve here and I could say some people have wanted to get involved. This is where it starts is seeing yourself as a bond servant of Christ and, and get real with yourself and say, is this, you know, Jesus says in another place, he says, um, count the cost, you know, count the cost. Part of counting the cost of serving Christ is like, you know, do you have the time to commit to it, you know? Do you, um, have, have you stepped into this like, you know, this is my priority in life. Do I have time to give excellence to Jesus Christ? Now, I know he's perfect, but do I have time, you know, to, to keep um, him as the center of my life, you know? And that's what Paul uh, is saying here, no? It all starts with the gospel, you know, and, and today if you haven't 
um, you know, been saved. If you think that you're saved, but you're not sure, um, I'm going to share the ABCs of the gospel with you because I, I like how J.D. Frog does it, honestly, and it's just kind of really cool to, to end our messages with uh, the preaching of the gospel. Um, if you want to come into a life of service with Christ, it first starts by getting saved. You know? So the first thing you do if you, want to, if you want to get saved today, and if you say, I know I need to get right with the Lord, and I, I know I've never repented of my sin, that's the first thing is I just need to admit that I'm a sinner. You know, I need to sit here and, and, and be real with myself and say, I know I've broken God's laws. I know that I've fallen short of the glory of God. You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The next thing I need to do, if I feel God, uh, if I sense God pulling me into a real relationship with him today, is I need to believe that Christ is the one that died in my place. Christ died because of my sin. I need to believe that today. That might be a refresher from somebody that maybe has even been a Christian for so long. They take these things for granted and say, do you really believe that a man on the cross died in your place? Has it translated to godly living in your life? And believing that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. It's that simple. If I really believe this in my heart and my mouth has no problem confessing it, if I have genuine faith in him to deliver me, he will. The Bible says anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the C then is for confess. Confess my sin to the Lord and confess that he is Lord of my life. Now, if you've done that and you're sure that you've done that, I really want to challenge you with this. I don't want to be a hardcore guy, you know, because I'm, I'm really trying to work on that. I'm trying to grow in godliness. You know, I know I say a lot of hardcore things, but I really want to challenge you with, like, if you're a Christian here today and you haven't seen yourself as a bondservant, if you haven't seen yourself as property of Jesus Christ, belonging to him, if he doesn't dictate your schedule, where you work, you know, when you work, how you spend your money, how you treat your family, how you raise your kids. If God isn't the one, if Christ isn't the one setting the agenda for your life, for your marriage, for your singleness, for everything, you really have got some reflection that you need to do. You know, Aaron and I have been thinking about this recently. It's just like Satan is so deceptive. You can walk with the Lord for a really long time. And what happens when you walk with the Lord, the longer you walk, sometimes if you're not careful, you can get very complacent and you cannot even like look at yourself really accurately and say, well, you know what? When I really get an accurate look at myself, I'm not really living this as much as like I really thought that I was. You know, maybe I'm doing really well in one area, but maybe I'm really not in others. You know, are you a bondservant? Have you given your life, you know, does he dictate? Is he the master of your life? I just want to encourage you and leave you with that today. Mm -hmm.